Uh, well, welcome to Eden, really pleased to see you, really pleased to share this event with you and talk to you about our campaign, Food Matters. Now, why does food matter? Well, the answer is pretty obvious because we all eat. So, first and foremost, it's something that connects all of us together. It doesn't just feed everybody in this room, it feeds eight billion people around the world. Sadly, some have too much, Sadly, some have too little, but there is enough food to go around. And the thing that really gets me is that food ultimately comes from plants. Plants capture carbon dioxide from the air. Amazing. They help climate change. Food helps climate change. So why does our food system create a third of the greenhouse gases in the world? It doesn't really make sense. So it's a miracle and it's a disaster at the same time. So, a little bit about Eden. We're a global movement. We work with nature to look at the planetary emergency, to address the planetary emergency. And when I say global movement, you're all here at Eden. I don't know how many of you know, but we've got another project starting in Morecambe. We've got another project starting in Dundee, and one starting in Qingdao. So we're looking at four destinations across the world. And in addition, we have wild sites. We help to regenerate rainforests in Costa Rica, and we're planting wildflowers right the way across the UK. What's that got to do with food? A lot, because it looks after the pollinators. And with the pollinators, they help to look after a third of our food crops and are really important in, wild, in um, urban areas, particularly when we need more pollinators. And that's where Dan, who's standing at the back, if anyone wants to speak to him afterwards, is Mr. National Wildflower Centre. Waggle your arms, Dan. Waggle your arms. So what does Eden do? Well, we aim to inspire and to share ideas and to do stuff. We transform negatives into positives. I stood in the bottom of this hole with my little boy who was six several years ago. He's back at the house waiting for me. He's 31. And we'd come down to Cornwall for the weekend to meet Tim Smith. More about that in a minute. I'll just show you what happened to this place. And I feel, I'm so honored to work. I feel so grateful to have worked here all this time. I feel like it's like a little time machine that's gone past the last 22 years. And we've actually seen that happen in front of our eyes. You can transform negatives into positives. It is possible. So I mentioned first of the weekend down in Cornwall in 1995. I used to be a television producer. I was making a program called Fruity Stories. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember Fruity Stories. It was about 25 years ago. Oh, I'll tell you about, that, about her in a minute. That's uh, Infinity Blue, and she's having a bit of a... She's gone off on one, but she, she'll calm down again in a minute. So 25 years ago, making a program called Fruity Stories... Needed somebody interesting, I won't say eccentric, but interesting, growing peaches or pineapples. And my researcher came in to me, she said, I found this guy in Cornwall. He's working at a place called the Lost Gardens of Heligan. They've taken a garden which was completely overgrown, an amazing vegetable garden from the Edwardian times. And back in the day, in 1911, the guys went off to war, the gardeners, and they didn't come back. And the garden was overgrown, it was covered in brambles, and Tim decided to restore this garden back to its former glory. And unlike many of the gardening projects across the UK, it wasn't about restoring the house, it was about restoring it in the memory of the gardeners who tilled the land and all that we can remember from how we used to garden together. So I, I rocked up to have a chat with him. He was perfect television material. It was amazing. And he said, what do you do? I said, oh, I tell stories about plants and people, and I make TV programs and write gardening books and stuff. And he said, um, will you give all that up and come and help me set this place up? And I just, I remember it was 1995. I said, yes. And I sold my house to move to Cornwall. And when I got here, we had no money. There was no money to pay me with. And there was five of us. And we, the five of us who started this place said, because Tim said to us, what would you rather have on your tombstone? I wish I had, or I'm glad I did. And it was a really important moment. Um, and we're all still here, which is great. And we got some money from the Millennium Commission and various others in the end and managed to, managed to get Eden going. And the pineapple's really important to us. 
So important that if you go into the chamber behind you in a minute, there's a 75 ton sculpture representing the same shapes as that pineapple, which is the Fibonacci sequence. And the Fibonacci sequence is seen in pineapples, it's seen in pine cones, it's seen in all plants if you look at them under a microscope, and it's seen in that, in that room in there. And what the Fibonacci sequence in plants is all about, they're all little buds, and a sunflower has this shape as well. And a sunflower is not a flower. It's hundreds of flowers which have given up their individuality to create something better together. And that's what we're trying to do here. And that's why we're working with our marvellous friends who are going to speak in a moment, because we've created a stage on which to share all the stories where we can have a positive future. So why did Tim ask me to come and work for him? I told him a story about a tree. I remember it. I said, oh, well, before I worked here, he said, what did you do, used to do? I said, well, I, had, I did a degree in botany, and I did a postgrad in looping hormones. That's another story. And, um, and then I tried to get a job. And because I knew how plants worked, the jobs I could get at that time were how to destroy them, because I knew exactly how a herbicide could kill a plant. So much to my parents and colleagues and everybody's horror, I just walked out. I walked out of academia, and <sighs> instead went and taught youngsters who'd been expelled from school horticulture, walked into the room, and it was a lot scarier than standing here today. They were smoking, and one of them was eating a piece of glass, actually. Anyway, so we, we, did, we did practical gardening together, and then I had to do some teaching with them, and I said, OK, you know, we're going to do photosynthesis today, and they looked so bored. And I said, well, haven't you done that at school? I was like, oh, well, I don't know. I said, OK, well, you're here because I need to teach you this stuff. I'll tell you a secret. I just walked out of a job and pretended I was a teacher so I could teach you. But I don't know how to teach. I haven't got a clue. So you teach me how to teach, and I'll teach you the story, and then, and then we can go from there. So I said, OK, we're going to do photosynthesis. I said, so, OK, let's start from the other end. What do you breathe? And one of them said... Oxygen. Actually, one of them said air. That's a good start. And then one of them said oxygen. I said, well, where does it come from? So, wouldn't it? I said, well... You, you breathe 20,000 breaths a day and you wake up the next day and the oxygen's still there at 21% in the atmosphere. And if it was 26%, we'd all burst into flames. And if it was 15%, we'd all asphyxiate and die. And they went, what? I said, I said well, where do you think it comes from? And they said, I don't know. I said, plants make it. And one of them said, but, no, he said, well, see, he said how awful, you know. He, he swore, but I'm not saying that here because it's being filmed, I think. So, um... So that's where we started, and I had this penny-dropping moment that the kids had been through the entire school system, and they didn't know what kept them alive. They didn't know about the oxygen that they breathed, and they didn't know why they breathed it. And we breathe oxygen to break down our food, and our food, as we said at the beginning, is made of carbon dioxide and water and sunshine. And we live in a global garden. It's my favourite picture in the whole world. This is, a, this is our global garden. We live on this tiny little bare pale blue dot, which is whizzing around the sun at 67,000 miles an hour. And we live next to this massive fireball. And all the food you eat every day, in and out, gets its energy from that massive fireball. And why aren't we dead? Because that's quite scary, that big fireball. In the middle of this little blue dot is a magnet under our feet, whirling round and round. Same, it's the same temperature as the sun, it's 6,000 degrees. Same, same temperature as the sun and it deflects all of these magnetic rays. So we're not fried to death. We're exactly the right distance from the sun, so the water is liquid. We've got this thin skin on the sun around the edge of the earth where all of the gases and the soil and everything are formed, and they work in these wonderful cycles. And this wonderful little ball gives us fresh air and clean water and fertile soil and rich biodiversity and a stable climate and an amazing recycling system. Hurrah! Sadly, that's not the end of the talk, because we're trashing it. It's, you know, and I think it's because we've disconnected from nature. We aren't connected to nature anymore. It's not, in the, even in the dictionary, if you look at the Oxford Dictionary, it defines nature as something like plants and trees and everything apart from humans. We have been disconnected and separated from nature, and we need to put it back together. So. We've created Spaceship Eden, this place, which is a microcosm of Spaceship Earth, to help show stories of the work that we do, stories of the work that everybody else does, a platform on which our guests can come and tell their stories, to show how we can transform negatives into positives and make a difference. 
So in the biomes, when you can, you can go and have a look um, during the evening, the biomes are divided into two. Half of it is wild, half of it is cultivated. The wild sides show us how we get our fresh air, clean water, fertile soil, etc. And the cultivated sides show how we can grow food regeneratively, how we can grow resources for food, fuels, and medicines and materials. And we, that's all of the food you'll get in our hospitality areas and our shops, because we don't franchise anything. We don't franchise anything here. We tell its stories in the biomes and we serve that food. I've got all the menu written down here, but I won't do too much advertising. But it's, it's mainly plants, mainly plants. So we tell the story in the biomes and outside. We use exhibits and we use art and we use events. We use all sorts. So in the visitor center, I don't know if you saw it on the way, and we've got dead cat, sorry, plant takeaway which we all call Dead Cat. And it's a little puppet show which moves and slowly everything gets undressed and they end up naked and dead on the floor. Um, and people laugh, but it shows how we depend on plants for food and fuel and medicines and materials. And then in the Mediterranean biome, there's a massive sculpture of Dionysus, the bull, who started off as god of horticulture, then became god of the vine, then became god of wine, then became god of excess and went too far and things went out of balance. We have a sugar truck in the rainforest biome. Please go and have a look at it. It was a heck of a job getting it in there. Uh, I don't think we're ever going to get it out. It's one of our designers here. So we're never going to get it out, are we? So that tells the story of sugar, and we serve that sugar in all of our products. It's called Penella, and it's got all of its vitamins and minerals and everything left in it. We make our ice cream with it. And the people who, who grow this sugar in Colombia... It's done in a responsible way, which protects the land and also protects their livelihoods, which is really important. Global gardens, you can find out loads of stuff to do in allotments. And upstairs, we have an exhibition called The Act of Gathering, a beautiful art exhibition from cultures all over the world, showing how important food is to our culture, not only to our bellies. This is a bit difficult to see, but you'll, you'll get the gist. We don't just serve any old food here. We have a food system. So we look at where the food comes from. We look at how it's grown. We look at what we do with the waste. All of our waste is recycled. Everything we do, we look at, is it seasonal? Is it local? Is it organic? Is it fair trade? We have this massive matrix which we use for all the food that we, that we serve to keep the carbon footprint and down as low as possible and to ensure that it protects biodiversity and livelihoods really important and it's quite a hard task to do for a million visitors a year <laughs> so beyond the destination just outside of all the attractions that you see we do schools program this is my friend sam i don't know if she's still here but i always use a picture of her eating a banana i don't know if you can see the kids faces but they're in just complete what is she doing um talking to a banana and then these other two um pictures we do we work with a lot of groups in and around and outside in our outer estate area. And here we have our, our growing systems here that we do with communities. That's that lying on the line, that's spaghetti. We made spaghetti up there the other day. And then we cook it all. And this is with a, a group called Compass, who, who are young people who are not in employment educational skills. And it's amazing the difference that eating and growing food makes. Then we do national projects. We have the big lunch. How many last year, Peter? Um, uh, 13.4 million. 13.4 million. If you want to talk about the big lunch, there's Mr. Big Lunch over there. So uh, the big lunch gets people together right the way across the country. And it's a case for celebration. It overcomes loneliness. It overcomes depression. It's not just about food. And then we do learning programs, both here and in Dundee and in Morecambe. In Morecambe, we've started, a, um, um, sorry, Dundee, we've started something called the Guilds, where we used, there used to be guilds in the city. We're reinventing the guilds, so we have a guild of growers, so communities can come together and grow, grow food. The one that's just kicked off is we have a guild of resourcers, and they're finding all the materials in the city that to reuse to build the Eden in Dundee. And then we have international projects. This is Costa Rica, 20 years ago, very degraded, been overgrazed by cattle. A guy bought it, fenced it off, and let the birds poop it back to life. Birds have poo having lots of fertilizer with seeds in, absolutely perfect. 
Amazing. The rivers restarted to flow again. The clouds started to come back. The whole atmosphere changed and it cooled the planet. And there was one thing that wasn't <clears throat> in that area, which was people. So Eden has appeared and we're working with people so it protects livelihoods as well. And the people are growing crops in the rainforest to make the rainforest worth more alive than dead. So back to the pineapple and the, <clears throat> and the seed. If you can see all those little nobbles, you can see all the different things that we do with the projects and the programs and the destinations and for, for people locally, nationally and internationally, showing what you can do to make a difference. So that's all about what we do. While you're here today, you can pledge for action, pledge for food. These can be applied to anything, but they work really well with food. So I'll, I'll point them out. So there's care. Can you see it all right? Yeah. So there's, there's care. And it's about caring about food rather than it just being something stuck on your plate that you eat when you're hungry. It's a reverence of food, loving your food. Then learn, the second one. Learn about your food. Learn where it comes from. Learn all about it. And it can make a difference. Reduce. Yes. Eat food, mainly plants, not too much, is what Michael Pollan says. <laughs> we eat too much. Reuse. You reuse your cups and your sporks, if anybody's got a spork. Cross being a fork. Recycle everything you can, and if it's made of organic waste, make compost. Compost is the best thing in the world. It captures masses and masses of carbon and stores it underground. The one down the bottom you can't see very well is by. Look at the label on everything and see... If it's fair trade, is it organic, is it local, is it seasonal? And that can make, can make a huge difference. And travel. In terms of how it gets here, ship freight uses about 10 times less carbon than air freight. So we just don't do air freight. Anything that comes from other countries, we use ship freight. We do use other countries because we have coffee and we have tea and we have sugar. And it's really important that we support those livelihoods in an appropriate way, in ways that are looking after the soil. And then <clears throat> grow your own. Who grows their own food? A little bit of food. So if you've got a window box or a pot on a windowsill, anything you've got, you can grow a bit of rocket. It's called rocket because it grows really fast. You can have an allotment, you can have a garden. But growing your own food is one of the most satisfying things in the world keeps me really calm when I go home growing my food. Eating. Again, eat plants, mainly food, not too much. And finally, if we all do all these little things, it will make a difference because if we all do it, we'll create a policy shift. And somebody told me last week, and I'd love to know if anybody here knows any more about this, if you can get 3% of people to change in the way they do things, everybody will change. We have got climate change. Is here, you can feel it today. But if we all do something, especially by what we eat, we can make a massive, massive difference. And if we all make a difference, and there's 3% of us, if you look at the rest of the people here, if we can create that tipping point, we can do something about it. So, keep your eye on the ball. And we'll have a healthy planet with healthy people. Thank you very much.